Okay, if you, if you decide to download now, so you better wait for one more day because we are planning an update to this build that's currently available. But still, we will get a notification about that too. Okay, I'll be speaking about the uh, history of the project, about uh, some details about architecture, about our approach, about our code base, about the team. So, a lot of internal interesting stuff. Okay, we started thinking about creating .NET ID many years ago, probably with version 1 of ReSharper. When we designed the entire code base, we already created architecturally a uh, background for this ID. So we didn't build our code uh, dependent on Visual Studio, but we inverted the dependencies in this uh, area and we actually created a Visual Studio integration as a plugin to reach our platform. Okay? So, and uh, Sometimes later, the first product based on the ReSharper, but not dependent on Visual Studio was released, it's .peak. .peak is basically the same code as ReSharper, but it's running in a separate shell uh, as standalone UI, pro UI product. Okay, the problem with this, why we didn't continue to evolve this into a separate ID, there are several reasons for that. First of all, it's only Windows, because its UI is Windows. Um, it uh, lacks some uh, IDE functionality, like version control integration, framework for debugging, uh, many, many features that are already implemented in IntelliJ ID are missing in this, in this program, okay? But uh, we also, in parallel, we've been thinking about building c -sharp support in IntelliJ, yeah? And uh, we've been thinking about it for a long time, starting from this version of IntelliJ IDEA. But uh, still, in this case, if we would uh, just implement C-sharp support in IntelliJ IDEA, we would need to rewrite the entire code base. You know, uh, C-sharp support is, it, it's great. It's, it's a great amount of code. Yes, it's about uh, 500 projects now. 50,000 files, c -sharp files, yeah, it's a great amount of code. And we would need to rewrite everything from scratch, and we wouldn't need any competitive advantage over, over anybody if we started from scratch. So, what IntelliJ idea, it's powerful, it's cross-platform, it has lots of extensions, uh, supports all many, many languages, has VCS support, and it has framework for every feature that ID needs. like debugging. Yes, you, you know that uh, uh, it's relatively easy to implement debugging for C Sharp, but uh, framework for debugging, all the UI, all the interactions, of creating some power synchronization, uh, it's a quite complicated model. But uh, when you have this model implemented with, uh, uh, with debuggers for other platforms, implementing debugging for C Sharp is not that complicated. Okay, but uh, we didn't go either way for, for the reasons I just explained, and we decided to reuse all the power of ReSharper and all the power of IntelliJ IDEA platform, uh, and our challenge was to combine the two platforms, to make communication protocol between the two worlds, and to make it fast, responsive, and easy to implement without writing all the code completely. Okay, to go further, we need to dive a little bit into our architecture of our IDEs. Yeah, you can say that uh, our IDE starts from application layer. It's a common code which is not uh, related to IDE at all. It's component containers, uh, it's uh, action system, it's trading models, and everything else that's related to any other program, to any other application at all. Yeah, then comes a uh, model with the documents, files, and projects. Uh, the, at, the, at this layer, we, are, we have project system support like MSB, DNX, or, or some, uh, for example, IntelliJ IDEA project system. 
And uh, the, the top layer of this is a language dependent layer. When we parse files, we create syntax trees, build some language semantic. So we add this complex, this, this level of complexity, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is what constitutes IDE with all the language support. And on the top of these three three main uh, modules, three main parts of the IDE, we build services and features. Let, uh, Architecture on services and features is quite flat. Services and features are independent and uh, only communicate with, uh, with the platform. Okay? Language support is uh, something that differentiates our company. And uh, I'll explain in, in a few words uh, what language support means. Uh, again, uh, in the very background we have files text of files and uh, we parse them create syntax trees in syntax trees we have uh, all the details of the program with the comments uh, spaces you know sometimes we use abstract syntax tree which is uh, not what we do because abstract syntax tree con con contains abstract syntax abstracted for compilation not for id Using syntax trees, we build indices for all the files. When you open solution and Sharper says, OK, I'm updating files, updating indices for files, we scan all the files, extract essential information, and use it uh, for, for semantic symbol resolution later. And uh, this uh, process is incremental. We incrementally build this information, extract this information only once and uh, we merge it into one single index and use it in uh, every feature. So we have uh, syntax trees for files and index where we can resolve symbols. And on top of this code model, we build our features. For example, if you run rename in Sharper, so it analyzes which tree node is under carried. It uh, uses indices to resolve, for, to, to resolve to know what entity it is. Uh, and uh, later, all the features have references to this complex model. Why I'm talking about, I'm talking about it just to explain that features in ID are complex. And whenever you try to extract some single feature out of the code base, it has so many dependencies on, uh, s on, on different complicated models, like syntax trees and or indices or project model. And it's very hard to make some uh, cut off to, to uh, make some uh, protocol which should work uh, across Java and C-sharp, which uh, implies some serialization or, of, of the data. So using this architecture, we can't uh, do any cross-platform, uh, any cross-runtime yes, cross communication. We should have some simpler data, OK? If you, if you have any questions, please ask. OK, no, no questions so far. Is it understandable? Yes. OK, OK, that's great. Um, for example, one more feature, cold completion. When you run cold completion, you got a list of items. What's item? Item is just string, it appears on screen. But uh, behind every item, we have references to code models, so when we, when we keep click on it when we insert item. Sometimes we need to insert usings. Sometimes we need to modify code a little bit to insert this item. So this item has references to entire code model. So we can just transfer this item from one runtime to another. OK, OK. One more thing I'm going to tell about is uh, Sharper. As I said before, we Sharp is already not dependent on Visual Studio. Visual Studio is uh, a plugin. Okay, it's not a plugin. Visual Studio integration is a plugin to Resharper. <laughs> but Resharper code can run separately. Yeah? And we have lots of other products that we use Resharper code base. And uh, in essence, they're the same as Visual Studio integration with uh, Resharper. Is really sharper, yeah. 
Example of this product is dot .memory, dot .peak, dot .trace, dot .cover, or for example, our unit tests, uh, they use the same principle. Yeah? They abstract, they implement uh, components that are missing from Visual Studio. Uh, so we are, uh, we are getting a uh, test environment. Or reach up a command line. Command line probably is the most closest to, to ReSharper running in background of Rider. ReSharper command line is approximately the same. Okay. Now I'd like uh, to talk a little bit about difficulties of uh, supporting uh, this architecture. Because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, 500 models, 500 products. And we have, we have about eight different configurations, different products. And for each product, uh, we need to configure it and to run it somehow. Yeah, to choose models that are relevant to this or that product and to run it. And it's uh, not easy to create all these models because uh, there is, if you, for example, create one model, and we introduce just some new functionality, and uh, you need to decide which products require this functionality. Uh, is it related to dot trace? or to dot cover or to just resharper, should it run in command line or any other product. So that's how we came to inversion of this dependency. So previously we used to have a product descriptor that knows about models that are related to this product. But uh, we ended up in having too many models because uh, you need to you need to split functionality into different models. Every time you don't need something in one product and you need something in another product and it's located in one model, you need to split it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very not effective. It's where it's introduced. So there's lots of modules just to manage configuration of different products. So these are models and this when you switch to another, you, you need another model. So we introduced a system. We annotated all our code base per model, per some namespaces, per single classes and models with a simple concept that is zone. Okay, think about zone as a piece of functionality that can be named somehow. For exa examples of zone are refactorings, C sharp support, or Visual Studio integration or some other semantically relevant to us sem semantical concepts. And we annotated, in Resharpa we annotated all our code with these zones. And when we start a product, we just enumerate what features we need in this product. For example, Resharpa requires code analysis, navigation, refactoring, support for all languages, and a trans individual studio. <coughs> Command line tool only requires code analysis, and uh, support for all languages and it runs in command line environment. Just simply by enumerating these uh, zones and using the same binaries, we can run every other product from a single code base. And the ReSharper host, which is a background process of our IDE, it leverages the same concept and it uh, just, uh, it, it's different from ReSharper in just one thing. It uses another environment. I can show to you how it looks in the code. This is a Rider, this is ReSharper open to Rider, uh, and this is main method of ReSharper host. Okay, if we go to main, actual main, <laughs> uh, and you can see that uh, To start a Sharpie host, we only need to provide one interface to there. This is boilerplate code of starting a product. It's basically the same. The only thing that's different is this one interface. And if it, you take a look at this interface, it has some dependencies, which mean when you run this feature, which is Sharpie host, it should run another features like Sharpie fe host feature zone. If you take a look at code, our code is annotated using such 
annotate a class, so our component container mm -hmm. knows about it when it starts a product. We analyze which namespaces, which classes are annotated with uh, this thing, and we only start these that are known for, for this product. Okay? That's quite a complicated concept. We're, we've been thinking about it a lot. So, but it's very, it's very useful to support uh, multiple products, product family, to be able to use the same code for dot .cover and for ReSharper and to be able to run them together in Visual Studio or separately is extremely useful. So any questions so far? Yeah. When did you arrive to this architecture? Like, was it like five years ago? It was in ReSharper 9. We introduced all the system in ReSharper 9. Yes, yeah, quite fresh. Okay, okay. So we need to establish communication between IntelliJ and between ReSharper. So we started thinking about how, how we can do it and we formulated several things that should be fundamental, that we can change. So first of all, or all the communications should be asynchronous. So we know that ReSharper is notorious for not being very responsive, you know, yeah. That's probably because uh, lots of code in Visual Studio is uh, bound to UI thread because of COM, because of you know all this API that can be called free threaded. The other thing is a uh, huge memory traffic, huge time that we spend in garbage collection because we are close to we close to available memory to, to, to the limit of available memory in 32-bit product process. Okay, but so we decided to handle a, this uh, problem architecturally by not allowing our communication to be synchronous in any way. In any way. When you are inside IntelliJ idea, no actual code is running for analysis for, for anything else, but it's, also, it's all, always responsive because it either performs hired operation but asynchronously or it operates simple local some makes some si simple local operations and it shouldn't require any CPU cycles. Second thing is uh, we put limitation on what we send using this protocol. We should send as few data as possible, and that, that's really important. Just uh, okay, uh, think about code completion. We can send. A syntax tree. But syntax tree is lots of data. It's hard to serialize, it's hard to send it. But to show code completion, we only need to send a few strings. And to send a markup model, we only need to send a few ranges with some annotations to it. Yeah, it's uh, very little data if you think about it. And the third thing is. Uh, we never send same data twice. Yeah, if you already analyze some file, and uh, we don't request the same da data twice. Yes, we we need to organize our system so that data never repeats. So this makes guarantee that we work fast and uh, and responsive. Okay, you know that. Okay, <laughs> I'll skip it. Uh, think about it. What what is view model of IDE globally? This writer, some project opened in it, uh, and the view model of of this UI is, is it's simple. I think some text text is annotated with some uh, with some mar some highlighters so that IntelliJ can, can highlight it. When you hit Alt Enter. You have some menu with two strings in it. Uh, if you open some tree, some tree view, tree view is basically a few, a few strings connected to each other, related to this is parent, this is child. You know, that's very, 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 very simple model, yeah? And we thought, why don't we take this model as a basement of our protocol? Why don't we transfer only data that is required to, to show UI, okay? 
And what is view model actually, usually? Uh, it leverages some, some reactive data, and basically it's three, I, I, can, I can name three, maybe you can name more. Uh, first is property, which is uh, some mutable data that you can listen to, you can observe changes of some, some simple data. You can, uh, uh, it can be comment. Comment is basically very simple too, because it's just reaction and action, and uh, it uh, also includes state, like it's available or not. It's, it's maybe a combination of properties, but comment is really a one-way communication. You click some button, and you're, you have a comment that's related to it. And you have collection, collections, observable collections, yeah? So that you can see every item that goes in and goes out. So you have, if you can monitor collection changes, you can bind your UI to this collection. Are there any other re reactive entities used in, in VVM? Probably no, okay. So we, we didn't come up with other uh, entities either. Okay, and this is reactive, right? Is it? <laughs> it, it is, yeah, you're, okay, you don't put statements, you don't put your program, you say your program what to do. You define these properties, in this case it's property, some value which can change the state and you can observe it, and you define dependencies. So some, are, some values are dependent on other values. And you can observe the entire system. If you take view model of this IDE, so you can take this view model and you can notify, you, can, you are notified about every change in this view model. Okay, let's take some, uh, some scenario from Rich Harper. For example, you run rename. You can see that uh, rename it uh, makes some kind of session on both sides of communication. For example, if you hit run on the sharper side, it, it should uh, invoke some progress that is, uh, uh, the sharper should decide what, what to rename. It needs to execute some code. The sharper needs to execute some code, show some progress, and eventually it shows some dialogue. It can show dialogue, so it says IntelliJ idea. Hey, IntelliJ idea, show some dialogue. Okay, IntelliJ idea dialogue can live separately without any communication with ReSharp, we enter a new name, hit uh, next, and then, uh, then uh, everything comes to backend, some, some progress again, which uh, is shown uh, in the IntelliJ idea, and so on. Can you see that we share the same states of executing some action on the both sides? which uh, makes it clear that we need to have some structure in our communication protocol. So we introduce the same structure, the same hierarchical entities on the both sides. The same result enter. Yeah, okay, I don't need to explain that. So what we decided to do, we decided to take this hierarchical structure of reactive entities and to share it between the two runtimes. So our protocol is responsible for synchronizing this uh, entire model, entire huge tree of uh, every UI data that uh, we can provide from ReSharper. We can contribute to this uh, model, model uh, in the .NET world. We can contribute to it in Java by checking some checkboxes, by typing text, we contribute to a change in state of this model. And we can observe this change in state on the both sides. Yeah. And uh, our protocol is only responsible for, for sending changes from one side to another and back and so on. Okay, any questions about it? Is it simple, easy to understand? No? Is there a real synchronization between those two? 
Yes, yes, we, we do real synchronization. It's based on uh, some message queue library. We serialize serialized all the data binary and send them quite efficiently. Yes, we actually perform synchronization. But as I mentioned before, the data that we synchronized is, is only related to UI, to actual state of UI. And this is a small amount of data. This is a few of booleans, a few strings, a few, a few more complex objects, but it's usually a very small amount of data. But these are two processes, right? Yeah, these are two worlds, completely separated two processes, yeah. Hosted on, on the operating system, two separate processes. Uh, you mean how, how, is how, how performant it is to... Technically. Technically, to use sockets. Tries to sockets, yeah. So we, we, we run our in Rider as a Java process, we run our Resharper as a exe of .NET executable. Yes, we, and we are we connected to using socket. And on top of socket, we've built all the protocol. Protocol is quite high level, yes, it operates using these uh, reactive entities. Yeah. You write the model on the right side of .NET, and the other model in Java, right? Mm -hmm. No. no, no, we generate it from okay. a single okay. source. Yeah. I'll speak about it later. Okay, but yeah. it's generated in, in two languages. It's all generated, yes. Okay. And so yeah. You mentioned that you never ask the other side for the same thing twice. Yeah. Does it mean that you apply some kind of like caching strategy? Uh, the thing is that uh, this model it implies that we don't send the same day data twice because we don't have a request response protocol anywhere. As you can see with shared data, the worst thing that we can do is we can initiate some communication. As I, as I said, it's structural, yes? You can, uh, for example, if you run refactoring and inside refactoring you have some data, so you initiate refactoring which is some structure and the, on the one side you change the data, on the other side you handle it. So you never ask for some data. You just change it from the other side and uh, react on the change from the other side. So because the protocol itself, it keeps all the state, you don't need to send it whenever it's needed on the other side. So, so it... Okay, let's go further. Uh, what, uh, what does this protocol consist of? There are kinds of entities and there are types. Kinds are... Okay, they are different a little bit, but let's start with types. Types are on the left. Types are simple types, um, like integers, grids, uh, time, date time, struct or structures of, of other types. Yeah? And uh, as a protocol is not just uh, structure but it's a uh, it's reactive structure so you need to choose a uh, reactive fields yeah instead of using just fields but you can use fields in structures you can use also properties signals and maps signals is uh, about uh, the same as action is so you just signal data from one side to another property is a uh, immutable data that we can change on both sides of the protocol. And map is a mutable collection. You can add or remove for items in collection on the both sides of communication, and you can view these collections on the both sides. So, and we can build hierarchies of such, such structures. We can uh, make property of type some complex structure. That means that uh, at some point uh, the whole big structure appears in protocol. We can listen to this uh, structure on the other and we, we can act upon this reaction. Okay? Yeah? So a signal is effectively an event? A signal is like event, yeah. It's the same. <laughs> it's just a question of name, probably. Okay, uh, if we rewrite, if we take a look at uh, 
reflection from the point of view of the structural communication. So when you click rename in IntelliJ IDEA, actually action system got involved, but action system it uh, initiates refactoring, refactoring interaction on the back end, on, on the Resharpy side. And it uh, sets a property, the very top level property of current refactoring. IntelliJ IDEA listens to this uh, current refactoring property and it doesn't do anything because you know some refactorings execute completely without any, without any interaction, like introduce variable or save delete. It can, okay, it's executed and that's all. But uh, sometimes inside refactoring uh, interaction, you can trigger vi refactoring visit form. Some, some dialogue, yeah? And that's why refactoring visit form is nested to refactoring interaction as a property. So you first subscribe to current refactoring that it appears at all, and inside this uh, subscription, you subscribe to current refactoring window, to refactoring visit form. And uh, if it appears, if background, if backend, it uh, sets this property of current uh, refactoring window of visit form, UI will show UI. UI will, will show that for this form, yep, as a reaction on this property. And uh, inside this property there are a few, a few signals which uh, actually correspond to different actions that you can click on the visit form. You can click next, close, you, you can start refactoring. And there is some data related to this specific page that is shown in the refactoring yeah. wizard. Yeah, but it's all hierarchical. If solar uh, constitutes a tree that both sides of communication, they either set some entities or listen to the entities that are changed. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, so, so some Were there to wait for a dialogue? Yeah, you know, Resharper when it executes refactorings, it set the property. That's why we, how we can know that refactoring has started. Okay. Yeah? And uh, when it's completed, we set it to null. So it's finished. We set property and set it to null. During this interval of time where this uh, property is set, we listen to visual form to appear. If it doesn't appear, we show progress dialog which just blocks, blocks UI and shows progress. Okay? Um, so this protocol, it's uh, very easy from the point of view where when, you, when you take a look at it, some properties, structures, it's very simple. And it is, yes. And, but there are different aspects that we encountered uh, later when we started implementing all, all, all this in real life. Uh, I'll show a little bit, as, uh, I'll yeah, speak a little bit about it. So the first is, uh, initialization. So we have uh, all the boss uh, participants of this communication, they are very asynchronous program. So they initialize asynchronously and it may take several seconds to initialize. And at some point of this initialization, uh, these uh, two worlds should find each other and connect. And connect yeah? and, um, you don't need to, you, you, you can't miss data in this communication. And you don't know where the counterpart of this communication when it sets some data. So for example, if you have some property A, yeah, and during initialization you set it to some value, you, you, you can't miss this value on the other side. So you can subscribe it sooner or later. Yes, you can subscribe it before it was set, and you sub can subscribe to it uh, after it, it was set. Uh, but uh, if you use property, you don't have any problem. If you subscribe to it before, 
you just don't get any reaction and uh, you live okay with it. If you subscribe after it was initialized already and uh, the other part go got a cut it value, so the reaction triggers immediately, synchronously, and you get this value. So uh, properties, they try to, they, they solve the problem of synchronization, yes? The reaction executes when two sides know about, about this property. And if it's signal, it doesn't work this way. So if it was signal, we just would lose it. Yeah, and that's why this, some entities are not allowed on the top level of protocol because we have this uh, asynchronous initialization. So we call these entities persistent and transient. So persistent entity, they store the state, we can connect to them anytime. These are properties and maps and transient are just fields or signals so you need to ensure that communication has already started before you subscribe to them. Otherwise, you can lose some, some essential data. And then comes trading. Okay. What's the difference between a field and a property? Okay, field, if you consider structure, then inside structure there could be fields, which is just simple data. It can change. It initializes once, once their own structure is constructed. And the property is a wrapper around some, some value. It can change. So you can have a property of the owning structure. You, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, to, to solve this problem with a signal, you can wrap your signal inside a property and uh, negotiate this uh, property first. And then inside this property, you can use signal more or less safely. Okay, then comes trading. trading are both rich sharp and uh, IntelliJ idea, the multi-thread program, programs uh, with lots of threads. But uh, in both, wow, <laughs> scary. Uh, but in both in, in both uh, worlds, we have UI thread. No UI thread in IntelliJ idea. Yes, it's uh, it's understandable. It's UI program. But in the Sharpie host, we have a UI thread also, because lots of our synchronization concepts like locking uh, uh, and uh, message dispatch, internal message dispatch is related, is uh, re relies on the UI thread a lot. And uh, okay, we have message queue thread, which is uh, a, a thread created by this library, which, which we are using. And uh, we get notification about changes of about every change on this thread. And then we need to dispatch reactions to, to dispatch actual, subs to invoke actual subscriptions on reactive properties and maps and signals. And we can do it in a UI thread or in some background thread. I told you that uh, we only uh, send uh, some data that is uh, that's related to UI, but okay, I wasn't completely honest here, because sometimes uh, we need to send some big amount of data, and uh, which is not shown now in UI, but we need to, to send it uh, send it somehow, because we would need it immediately. For example, code completion. You move current in, a, in your editor. On every keystroke, we send lots of data, lots of lots of new completion items, so that if you can ta start typing or invoke code completion, then this da data is immediately available for you. So we don't need to to, to, to start this direction. But uh, we can send this data on on, bug on uh, UI thread because otherwise we would have some legs. Um, so we introduced worker threads, and uh, as you can see, some reactions on some properties can be dispatched on UI threads, some can be dispatched on some background thread. Okay, and here, can, here we can run into troubles because uh, all the messages are they come one, one after after each other, yeah. And uh, that's not true when we try to queue reactions on the other threads. For example, we had three messages 
And uh, when we queue reactions on the other thread, we can tinier process in other messages. And here we can come run into a situation where some data is uh, where some reaction is executed in, in wrong order. For example, here is an example of structural communication, like we introduce property A. Yeah, uh, then we set in a property X to one, and then we nullify property A. Yeah, we introduce some data, we introduce some inner data, and then we uh, remove all the all the stuff. And it, and uh, when worker thread, if we uh, choose to dispatch uh, messages from one property on UI thread, and we choose to display messages from the other property on background thread. So we can run into a situation where these are not synchronized. So we receive message from property that's already, its parent is null, yeah? And that, that's not, not what we want. So we, we had different, 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 different approach to this because we need background communication, but it uh, sometimes it introduces things like this. So now, we are trying to move all the background communication into completely separate clusters of our protocol, which are not related to other UI data. So inside the inside worker thread, we can uh, we can have all the messages sequenced yeah, inside one one thread that's responsible for uh, for all these reactions. Okay. Any questions? Then comes, comes uh, life cycle. So that, that's again, okay. that's everything about this tree, about this tree of reactive entities. And uh, we've been uh, playing with it for almost a year already, so we collected some um, information, we collected some bugs connected to it. Um, so another thing that's uh, interesting is initialization of this. Uh, some parts of this uh, tree. In some uh, features, for example, you run debug session. You know, debug session is lots of data. Uh, you can handle uh, different sessions at the same time. Yes, run two sessions. And inside each session, you have, date, you have many processes, many threads. Each thread has its local variables. Yeah. And uh, you need to transfer this data quite a complex amount of data. But when, when you hit back break point, you need to send a lot. And you need to construct some parts of the tree, some, some parts of the protocol tree, and you need to send it. And here comes the problem, how you, how you introduce this uh, huge part of tree into, into the common protocol, right? So you can uh, initialize a subtree, but uh, until it's connected to to the root tree, it doesn't uh, send any notification about the change. It, it only sends notification when it's attached to the global protocol tree, to, to the very root. And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, at some point we, we were needed to rewrite our protocol from scratch just to handle this uh, situation. Because, because uh, before that, we would need to construct all this data just in the live tree, step by step. But now we can construct lots of lo lo so some subtree, and we can just assign the subtree to some property of, of some entity that's already attached to root, and uh, all the reactions uh, will be executed at that moment. Okay, another thing is, uh, is concurrency. Properties can be uh, modified uh, on the both sides of communication. For example, if you have some UI form, uh, you can click uh, some checkboxes, and checkboxes can, uh, can uh, change its state automatically as a reaction on other checkboxes, right? View modeler is responsible for, uh, for, this, uh, for, 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 for these links uh, in ReSharper backend, and in, in UI you can click. 
what is essential for protocol is to keep invariant that data is the same on the both sides, even if someone has decided to modify it on the both sides. Okay, the, the only way how you can handle it is to, to ignore someone, someone's change, yes. This are events that uh, are completely asynchronous. We don't know anything. We can't synchronize them. We can't put lock in it, yes, because uh, we run in two different programs, different runtimes, and we set the same value. That's the problem that is solved by Google. The most, most famous solution is by Google and Google Docs. You know, they allow simultaneous uh, editing of the text, and this is not trivial, pro not, not trivial problem. It uh, involves operational transformation or something, some science behind it. But in, in, in our case, it's all simple. We can uh, handle uh, versions of the every property on each side. If we, have, we need two versions for each property, and each version it uh, corresponds to the version of modification on each side. On each side, yeah. So when you modify a property in IntelliJ, it uh, increments its version only. When we modify a property on ReSharper, ReSharper increments each, each part of version. And can you see that uh, when on IntelliJ idea side we receive this new value 2, it comes with a version 001, right? And uh, here we can know that when ReSharper was making this change, it wasn't aware about our change because his version of IntelliJ idea was zero at that time, yeah? And that's how when we know that this uh, change should be ignored. And the change uh, on ReSharper side, it just applies because, uh, because ReSharper is main in this communication. Who is main, we decide based on, based on specific situation. Just like duplicating the value from each side, from each side actually. Duplicating the okay. value. The, the version, if you say some value, some property is set to true. Mm -hmm. So it's true on the IntelliJ side and then it gets true on the R uh, side. Yeah, data is completely duplicated. Yes, all, 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 all the protocol is about duplicating the data on, on the both sides. Yes. Okay. So you're right. Okay, any questions? The same applies to, for example, text. Yes, we synchronize text in editor because IDE should receive uh, every change in text to analyze it, to build syntax trees, and so on. And um, uh, we don't send the entire text for, for files. We only send incrementally changes that the user has made in, in, in text. Another thing is uh, cardinality. So uh, one protocol tree is not enough. Sometimes we sometimes ID involves uh, running of different other programs. For example, if you need to run debug, you uh, you execute yet another program. <coughs> to, to debug Windows program, you, you need to run debugger in a process that uh, has the same bitness of the application that you are debugging. So we, can, we can't just run debugging inside ReSharper host, inside ReSharper process, right? So we need to run different other pro programs. And we synchronize the same state using, uh, using the same protocol. And we need uh, to know data about, about debugging in, in different, uh, in all three programs, right? So our protocol, uh, that's one of the challenges uh, that, that we face now. So, but we want our protocol to work uh, transparently, not only for two participants, but for more. Okay, and then comes DSL. I have already almost done with my presentation. Uh, DSL, we use uh, Kotlin for describing protocol entities. You know, Kotlin is uh, quite good for, for, for DSLs. Now I'll show you what uh, DSL looks like in Kotlin. Okay, this is what it looks like. Basically, this, this slide explains everything about DSLs. So this is Kotlin C-sharp. 
okay, I, I like C sharp. But sometimes it's too verbose. And uh, um, okay, what you can see here, here, here is a simple pattern. Uh, you can you have functions with uh, one parameter, and you can call other functions of the parameter, and you can uh, build nested constructs from this, right? And uh, this uh, pattern is uh, extremely helpful when you'd like to define some nested structure, some, some hierarchical structure, like XML, JSON, or, or any other hierarchical code. You can create DSL. You know, this, uh, if you call full HTML, right? And inside HTML, you have proper tags that are allowed inside HTML, right? Like body. Yeah, and you can uh, change type of X so that it includes method body, head, and, and so on, right? And uh, you can uh, create types for any nested structure using this uh, pattern. But all you need to do, you remove syntax, and uh, this uh, structure on the right is completely the same, but written in Kotlin using just Kotlin syntax, right? So now I'll show you a, a bit of the protocol that's uh, in the source code, but to understand it, you should uh, know that this curly braces, it means actually calling of this lambda parameter, right? Which is argument of foo. And when you execute this code, this code builds some tree structure, and you can uh, generate an, an everything from this tree structure. Okay? So, let's switch to code a little bit. Now we need to switch to IntelliJ idea. And here is definition of refactoring interaction. So on the top level, we have a property which is named current refactoring and which has type refactoring interaction, which is nullable. So mo most of types are not nullable, but adding nullable. Uh, adds uh, null nullability to this property. Because in Kotlin, nullability matters, so we need to distinguish it on the in protocol type definition. Okay, if you take a look at uh, refactoring interaction, then it's again property, wizard form, which is of type wizard form, and it has some, uh, some this field is required to show progress dialog, if it somehow that doesn't appear immediately, and this uh, signal message is required to react to to show message to to, to show message that refactoring can e execute in this context. Sometimes you click some refactoring and just says okay with the message box. I can't I can't do anything now. So this signal it uh, refers to. Uh, to this reaction. So inside wizard form, you have uh, lots of signals, lots of signals, and uh, property of type per progress. Yes? So that's basically it. And yet another property, it uh, refers to, to page, which is shown. So it's also property because inside one refactoring wizard form, you can change pages, right? So it's again property. So it's quite simple. That it's all data that's required. All our, this file, it describes for everything that's required for running rename. It has a definition of uh, common refactoring, uh, common refactoring window workflow and a few pages for rename. Yes, you can add pages for other refactorings, what we are doing, but we now only have rename implemented. From this code, we generate C-sharp, all the data classes, all the uh, serialization code, all the code of initialization, so it's all generated and uh, we use generated code in Kotlin and in C-sharp and bind to it or 
modify structures. So questions? So now I have a few words about, uh, until I say thank you, uh, challenges. So ch challenges include uh, integration with IntelliJ IDEA languages. So you know IntelliJ IDEA has support for many, many languages, has some nice features like language injection and strings, for example. Yeah, it's, it's extremely useful. You can inject JSON, HTML, CSS everywhere and edit it. Uh, we'd like to take advantage of this, I think, but the problem is we are, we are running out of process and you need to have PSIs, syntax trees, and uh, interact with IntelliJ IDEO code model a lot, so it, it will be hard, but we are going to do it. Uh, and uh, this protocol actually can handle rich up running inside Visual Studio out of process, which is uh, essential for, for many of our users uh, to have this experience of running a out of process because, because, because of 32 bits and uh, lots of performance problems caused by the sharper. Okay, that's all. Questions? Questions? Yeah? That is uh, our cast custom reactive framework, which I described. It consists of properties, it consists of maps, C and signals, and, uh, and a few extension methods to it, like view for each value, for each value not null. So we, as you can see, our approach to reactive is very maybe unusual. So we use uh, all, all mutable data all, all the time, yes. That's what uh, people usually are not recommended to do. And uh, in reactions to one properties, we just modify others in a completely imperative code. That's because uh, it's hard to build proper, proper dependencies. If you have lots of properties and you need to bind them, sometimes it's easy to subscribe to some properties and just to set others. So we don't need much of a reactive framework. F sharp. Yeah. F sharp. F sharp is technically very, very difficult. It, uh, it's uh, more difficult language than uh, C sharp in many aspects because of its type system, because of its simplest type inference. It uh, introduces uh, difficulties for IDE because uh, it has uh, declarations. Uh, that, uh, that don't have type, yes? When you analyze C-sharp, you have type for every declaration declared. You don't need to dig in, into method bodies to infer type. But in F-sharp, in, in you, you've got to do global type inference, which is very hard. And uh, we had a project uh, of uh, sharper supporting F-sharp, but it's, it never, it's never been a, anything uh, anything working, anything close to, to actual implementation. You know, I, I just don't believe in it. Yeah, so otherwise I would, I would support it. Yeah. Then the generic question is like, functional languages are going to be much harder to implement using this approach. Or is this approach? No, completely relevant. You implement support, f f support and you synchronize UI. UI is the same. No, functional languages are the same. The, the, the hard thing is to implement support for F sharp. Yeah. So there will not be um, F sharp support in any near future. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can say we are not working on F sharp support. That's true at the moment. And you know, Kotlin is. You no, know, it's just just. If you think about language, you, you know how F-sharp, <coughs> when it compilates, you know what, uh, how 
to actually this code is the generated code of pattern matching. How many different, how many structures is boxes? How many lambdas and closures it introduces at runtime? How bad uh, interoperability with C sharp is? The model of compilation is, I don't know, it's a nightmare. When you, when you compile your code, you need to, to write a single, all your program needs to be a, a single expression to compile your code in F sharp. Yes, because, but yeah, I, I just don't believe in it, no. But, but that's my opinion. I, I won't do it. If anybody <laughs> comes to me and says, hey, sorry, I'd like to, Implement F sharp, okay, but uh, but not me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wonder what uh, were other architectural solutions that you considered when you decided to use out of process uh, approach. Yeah, we have started with portable, with portable to serialize data, to bootstrap. Uh, and uh, our difficulties uh, were that we can to actually build reactive and upon these structures, even though it, it, uh, it didn't have generated to Kotlin, only to Java, which is also not very nice. No, what I mean is, uh, you were excited about Kotlin, and I think you had this crazy ideas of just generating or converting Resharper into Kotlin. <laughs> no, we never had these ideas. <laughs> no, never, never, never. No, it's it's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, if you, okay, if you convert it once, w w what would you do later? Right. You know, C sharp six, uh, it, it has changed the every other every feature in Resharper. Yes, every feature has changed since introduction of Resharper six. You know, it's it's live code code base, uh, and. If you generate Kotlin from C sharp, you would need to to support yet another bit because I don't believe in continuous generation. Yes, in continuous process of <laughs> generating C sharp and the Kotlin. Yes, it's, it's just no nonsense. And uh, the other difficulty is that uh, IntelliJ IDEA is another platform. It has other different concepts of project model or for syntax trees, different interfaces. So even even if we convert it once, we wouldn't fit platform interfaces and the platform concepts. Sometimes platforms are conceptually different. And to convert uh, a code model is a, a small amount of work. We, we would re-implement it easily. Code model for C sharp is about 5% of the sharp code. 5% of the whole code is a code model. The, everything else is features. Whether the source code of the sharper the repository is about what we need. Probably more, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't keep binaries in source control. <laughs> 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 really? <laughs> <laughs> Only NuGit. NuGit dependencies. Okay? Uh, there was this slide with the version synchronization between yeah. and is there an official name for that algorithm? Because I seem to remember something from the university, but I can't quite figure this out. Official, what is official name? I mean, like, you know... Operational transformation is an official name for the science behind synchronization of data. Okay, but this particular way where you keep a, good, uh, a version for each mm -hmm. participant in the communication... I don't remember, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. We just invented it, reinvented it already <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, I don't know, they're like Lampo. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's from uh, Lampo. Because yeah. it's at the back of my mind, but the university was like 10 years ago. Okay, <laughs> same here. <laughs> okay. When did you switch your uh, Vishapa development to Ryan? Oh, I didn't switch. <laughs> I didn't switch because we are still working on our only two people from our Sharpie team is currently working on Rider. No, no, I mean, when do you. Ah, when? In we are already developing Reshop and Rider, some parts. Yeah. Hmm? We are already developing Rider and Rider. That's my question. When did you start? Was that a big milestone? No. Rider, no, no. It started months ago. 
A month ago, yes, we started that little because uh, previously it was unusable at all. <laughs> Crashed all the time, hang, and so on. So and now, now, now it's much better. And you know, having public AP is private, even private AP, it stimulates a lot. Fixing bugs, exceptions, and hands, and uh, that's why we, you know, in, in my opinion, what we have now in private AP, no, it is usable, but hardly suitable for product for any for, for any actual development, right? But I switched to Rider to develop Rider, and uh, I sometimes run Visual Studio, but as times goes, I do it like fewer fewer times. So. Rider now, now can open three, six, this 500 project solution better and uh, than uh, the Visual Studio. It's much more responsive. It loads much faster because in Visual Studio it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost unusable. <laughs> the solution on this side. And I believe it will be our comp competitive advantage. We just can handle huge solutions and you don't have any problems. We reload projects uh, automatically out to changes in, fi in project files without any notification even. So you, you just update from source control, your solution files are changed, your project files are changed, and you just don't notice it. So you're saying you can uh, change the, uh, the project file without unloading it? Yes, oh. yes, you, you just change, save, and, and that's it, yeah. That is, that's the first thing that we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The synchronization between Rider and um, IntelliJ is done with um, IP, is it like IP based protocol? TCP IP, you have yeah. to do that. The, so yeah, it is. Right? Yeah, it's so You yeah. can theoretically run the resharp on another PC. Yeah, 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 it is possible. The only problem why, uh, why we can't do at this moment because we rely on the same files the same file system. Yes, we don't. We analyze files on disk, and on front end, IntelliJ IDEA reads files from disk. So that's. But we can we can handle it. We c it, it can be replaced. Okay, yeah. Debug session is not true, so you can remote debug. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Remote debugger will work just perfect. Using the Microsoft way or using the uh, synchronization? You know, first we will use. Uh, remote debugging from, from, from debug libraries, yes. But it's uh, possible to execute our code uh, of synchronization of debugger state and to execute debugging on the other machine if it's, if it's allowed. Uh, so, so we can implement remote debugger for every debugger. For mono, mono, C sharp, DNX. So you're able also to debug from Unity? Like Unity 3D? Yeah, why not? Yeah, it's already supported. You can open Unity projects so you can debug it. Does debugging actually work? Because uh, Unity is an older version of Mono. Older versions of Mono. Yeah, there's a different debugging protocol. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay, then I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, will there be any support for the um, CLR version of C? Yeah, there will be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in Rider also. Actually, uh, it's it, it it won't be there in uh, in this release. I'm not sure if it will be there in next release of Resharper, but some things are already working because you know we are developing C# -sharp support in C in, in 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 CLI in C++ CLI. So we we have motivation to to make it supported <laughs> and it's lots of code and, and we have difficulties because uh, our sharp is because cli is supported in cli it only compiles native assemblies i mean not any cpu it should be either 32 bits or 42 bits and you can't uh, add these are platform dependent. You can run can't run them on mono, and it's hard to convert them to core CLI too. 
but uh, we'll probably have to rewrite the comp compilated assemblies because, because we don't actually use uh, any native code. Uh, but we would need to convert. We, we try to make a CLI compiler. If you don't use MS Core Lib to run on Core CLR, but no luck so far. It's very, it's deep into our compiler, next to impossible. Okay, so I believe my time is okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. I don't know. We we'll probably we will not implement designer. Probably, probably, probably uh, we will implement uh, some live preview, which is. Uh, maybe a, a, a good replacement for designer, but more feasible. Yeah. Yeah. Can I open uh, some special project like uh, Windows Azure SDK project? Windows Azure. You know, you should be able. If you can't load it, just uh, create a ticket mm -hmm. and uh, we will support it. Because you know, it's all based on MS build and uh, Opening it, to, it's, uh, should be similar. But sometimes Visual Studio introduces some properties, some implicit properties, some different targets that you should execute to get all references. Um, so it, it may not work from the first attempt, but it will work eventually. Yes, yes, we develop it independently of the entire code base. Yes. I don't know when, but uh, we are we are planning to publish it with C sharp and the Kotlin backends. You would need to implement some build tasks, some, <laughs> but uh, but it's not dependent on C sharp at least. Okay, thank you, thank you.